Um, so let me begin with a bit of motivation for why we're doing this project. So if you compare the way that uh, countries do taxation and how that varies with different stages of development, a couple of things leap out at you when you study the data. The first is that the, the amount of tax revenue that different countries raise varies dramatically with the level of development. So the richest countries tend to be raising around 30 to 40 percent of their GDP in tax revenues, whereas the low-income countries tend to raise between 10 and 15 percent, and Pakistan is actually an outlier even on that uh, measure. It's around sort of 9 percent at the moment. The second thing that leaps out at you is that it's not just the amount of tax that's raised that's different, but the way that the taxes are raised that's very different. So in high-income countries, it tends to be these big broad-based taxes on income and consumption that do the heavy lifting, whereas in low-income countries, those taxes raise very little revenue. Uh, so, and if you sort of ask around to people why that might be the case, you get a, a bunch of stories, but one that keeps coming back over and over again is that rich countries rely very heavily on being able to extract information that's third party reported by firms to enforce taxes. So when firms report how much their workers are paid, that makes it much more difficult for the workers to then misreport how much their salary is, and so it's very clear what the tax liability is. So in this paper, uh, what I'm trying to ask is whether the taxation of salaried workers' income in Pakistan could help to close this gap uh, somewhat. So there's scope for doing that because in Pakistan this tax raises very little revenue at the moment. It raises about 1% of GDP, whereas in high-income countries that's more like 8, maybe even 9% of GDP. Uh, in Pakistan, though, the third-party reporting mechanism does exist. So salaries are supposed to be third-party reported by employers directly to the FBR. And the current rates of taxation on salaried income are fairly low, so there's scope for uh, raising additional revenues. I'd, I'd also like to point out that this project is quite a unique uh, partnership that, was, that sort of came about through a direct engagement between the IGC and the FBR, in which FBR identified that this was an area in which they were interested in figuring out whether there was scope to raise more revenues through uh, the taxation of, of the uh, personal income and leveraging the wealth of data that does exist at FBR to help with the enforcement of this tax. And so the IGC responded by providing the, the research and the intellectual input to do the analysis to see uh, what the scope for that was. We've now got a few results, so hopefully this will now feed back into uh, to some policy initiatives and uh, so we can also answer some of the questions that emerge from this, which I'll show you in a second. So let me give you a little bit of background on how I hope Sorry, no, how this works. So I was told not to put any equations in my presentation, so I duly put a an equation on the first slide, but I promise that it's the only one. So conceptually when uh, e economic theorists sit down and think about how taxation should be done, this is an equation that you'll see very often. This is the equation for the optimal linear tax rate on income. And there's a very key parameter in this. So the little e in the bottom there is the elasticity of taxable income. How strongly does reported income respond to the tax rate? So the higher that number is, the more responsive people's reported income is to the tax rate, the lower you should be setting that tax rate. So what I'm gonna try and do here is provide some evidence on how big that number might be. In order to do that, we have to decompose taxable income for this population into the three parts uh, that it is comprised of. So salaried workers have salary income, obviously. They also may have non-salary income, which they will be taxed on. And then they might also evade by misreporting the amount of income they have. So I'm going to try and uh, present some evidence on all three parts of that. So Pakistan has an exceptionally complicated uh, personal income tax system. So there are two separate schedules on, for the personal income tax, depending on whether your salary is more or less than half of your total taxable income. And here I'm going to be focusing on people whose uh, salary is more than half of their taxable income. These are the ones who are classed as salaried workers. These salaried workers at the moment face a significantly lower tax burden than those who are non-salaried, and I'll come back to that at the end. So the tax schedule that these guys face features 16 to 19 thresholds at different income levels at which the marginal tax rate that these guys have to pay jumps up. That allows me to do some, uh, some economics tricks to identify how people are responding to the presence of these thresholds and in turn say something about the size of that E in that equation at the beginning. I'm also going to be able to disentangle the effects of uh, the responses through salary income and non-salary income because there are so many of these thresholds in the income tax schedule. <coughs> 
a, a word about the role of employers here. So the employers directly report at the end of each year how much they've paid each of their workers to the FBR. And then the workers may independently file a tax return in which they're also going to report their salary, and I'm going to be able to compare those two reports. The employers are also supposed to withhold the income tax on their employees. And again, I'm going to be able to use that to say something about uh, how salary and non-salary incomes respond independently. So the data that I've been using to do this is administrative tax records from the Federal Board of Revenues. I'm using the income tax returns from 2008-9 until 2011-12. On these income tax returns, individuals, in my case salaried workers, are going to report their salary, any deductions that they have, any other income that they might have, and their total taxable income. There are about 670,000 tax returns in each year. I should point out that the population of Pakistan is about 180 million, so that's a very, very small number. Um, in those 670,000 people, there are about 165,000 of these salaried workers. And the second piece of data that I'm going to be using are what are called the employer statements. For the U.S. members of the audience, that's the equivalent of the uh, W-2 form. On this form, employers report what they pay their employees in salary and how much income tax they have withheld on their employees. I'm going to merge the two data sets, and I'm able to merge it about half of the time uh, in order to be able to compare what the worker and the employer has says the salary is. I'm not able to uh, match absolutely everybody. That's for a couple of reasons. First of all, people with very low salaries aren't actually required to file, although that's changing as we speak. Um, and also, on, especially on the employer statements, the identifier number, so the CNIC number or the national tax number, is often missing or inaccurate, and that prevents me from being able to merge the two data sets. So I'm going to go through the three parts of taxable income. So first, I'm going to start with evasion, and I'm going to talk about how salary responds, and how non-salary income responds, and then I'm going to conclude with some implications for the way that we should be taxing salaried workers. So starting with evasion, here I'm going to do an extremely simple exercise. All I'm going to do is match what the employer reports paying his employee and what the employee reports receiving in salary on his tax return. So in the first row here, you see that in a staggering number of cases, in just under 20% of cases, the employee is unilaterally reporting less than what his employer says that he has been paid. When you add that all up, we're missing about 16 billion rupees in income, which turns out to be about 16% of the salaried income of the people who are misreporting their salaries. And if you add that up and compare it to the entire amount of salary that's being reported, we're missing about 4% of salaries. If you convert that to how much tax revenue is missing, it actually goes up a little bit. So the people who, the, the employees who are misreporting their salaries are, are under-reporting their tax liability by about 21%. And so we're missing about 5% of tax revenues on salaried workers, just because the employees, when they file their tax returns, under-report what their salary is. This uh, behavior is also correlated with uh, what the tax rate these guys face is. So on the x-axis here, on the horizontal axis, I have the tax rate that the worker is facing on his salary. And on the vertical axis, I have the probability that a worker misreports what his salary is. And you can see that this thing is quite uh, sharply increasing. So richer workers who face a higher tax rate are more likely to underreport their salaries whereas the lower salaried workers are much less likely to engage in this behavior. And so this is regressive. Rich workers are more able to evade than poor workers. So there's widespread underreporting of salaries. So we only ha really have evidence on how pervasive this behavior is from one other country. It's at the opposite extreme. So this, this uh, evidence comes from Denmark. In Denmark, only about 1.3% of individuals underreport their salary. And when they do underreport it, they underreport it by 0.2%. So these are tiny, tiny numbers compared to what we're seeing in Pakistan. This suggests that even though you have this third party reporting mechanism where the employer has to report what the salary is, it's ineffective without the fiscal capacity to do the cross checking of whether the employee and the employer are reporting the same thing. Of course, conversely, that means, means that there are very high returns to the FBR investing in the capacity to systematically cross-check these reports and then chase after the guys who are uh, reporting different amounts. 
this, of course, is just the tip of the iceberg, right? All I've done here is compare what the worker and the firm are reporting the salary is, and I'm detecting when those two things are different by a significant amount. If the worker and the firm sit down and collude to, to misreport together and underreport by the same amount, then I'm not going to be picking that up. And undoubtedly, that does happen. And so it's, a, it's an interesting question that comes out of this. What would happen if you started cracking down on people uh, reporting different amounts? Would they just start colluding more to, to underreport? So turning to how salaries respond, here I'm going to exploit the presence of these uh, kinks in the tax schedule, so these thresholds where the marginal tax rate changes. These give people an incentive to place their incomes exactly at these thresholds. This is what we've uh, termed bunching. And the degree of this bunching is now proportional to that E number that we saw in the equation at the beginning. So the more people bunch at these thresholds, the bigger it means that that E is. And so that has implications for how we design policy. So let me just show you what the data looks like. Here, what I've done is I've put everyone in one picture and shown how close they are to the closest threshold in the tax schedule on the horizontal axis, and how many people are in each, at each level on the uh, vertical axis. And you see there's way too many people exactly at one of these thresholds. This implies that salaries respond very strongly to the presence of all of these thresholds, and therefore that the, this E number can be quite a big number. <laughs> of course, the salaries are determined through an interaction between the worker and the firm. So there's, an op there's a question here about whether it's the firms or the workers who are doing this responding. So to, to shed a bit of light on that, I'm going to focus on the salaried workers who also have significant amounts of non-salary income. Because for them, these thresholds, which are in terms of taxable income, don't give them an incentive to place their salary at one of these thresholds. So conversely, if I see that for these workers who do have non-salary income, their salaries are sitting at these thresholds, it means that that bunching must be coming from firms rather than workers. And hey presto, what do you see? There's in, if anything, there's even more bunching amongst these workers in terms of their salary. So this suggests that it's the firms really that are doing the responding here to the presence of these thresholds in the tax schedule, which in terms means that when we're thinking about enforcement and policy, we need to be focusing a lot more on the firms rather than the workers themselves. So finally, let me uh, say a word about non-salary income responses. That's, so if firms are the ones who are setting these salaries, then the question becomes whether the workers who have non-salary income respond in any way. So if uh, my boss tells me that I have a salary of X amount, does that change how much non-salary income I choose to report to FBR? So what I've drawn here is for the workers who do have significant amounts of this non-salary income, but have been placed at one of the thresholds by their boss, how responsive is their non-salary income but, uh, in putting their total taxable income at one of the other thresholds in the tax schedule? Because remember, there are between 16 and 19 of these thresholds. This picture gets a lot sort of jumpier, but you still see that there's huge numbers of people who put their income at exactly one of these thresholds. This suggests that, oops, sorry. We go back. This suggests that non-salary income is extremely responsive. So when workers get told what their salary is, they then sit down and plan, okay, how much non-salary income am I going to report in order to put my total income at one of these thresholds to minimize the amount of tax that I'm going to pay. This also has dynamic implications. So people are learning about these thresholds when their boss puts their salary at one of these thresholds. And then in future, they are much more likely to put their, their, their taxable income at one of those thresholds next year and the year after and the year after. So here the blue line, the top line, is people who are given a salary uh, at one of the thresholds. And the orange line underneath is people whose salary is not at one of those thresholds. And I can track these guys over time in the data that I have. So before, they're roughly comparable. In the year that the blue guys get a salary at a threshold, they're very likely to sit at one of the thresholds in terms of their taxable income. And the guys who don't receive a salary at the threshold are not. But what you see is that in subsequent years, this gap opens up. It's very small at the beginning, and then it becomes much larger afterwards. This tells us that people are learning about the thresholds in the tax schedule. Right? Before they were given a salary at this threshold, they didn't really know where they were. And then afterwards, they've, they've learned about this uh, threshold uh, issue, and they've become much more sophisticated in how they respond in the terms of their taxable income.
This means that there's a, there's a significant spillover between how you decide to tax salaries and how people's non-salary income is going to respond. That's actually quite important in low-income countries because a lot of people will have both salary income and non-salary income. So if you're thinking about taxing salary and non-salary income separately, you have to consider how the taxation of salaried income is going to affect uh, non-salary income that is reported. So let me conclude just with some implications for how we should think about doing uh, taxing of salaried incomes. The first very important thing here is that firms are key. Right? So the whole idea of having this third party reporting mechanism and asking employers to report what they pay their workers is that it's going to improve compliance. However, it's, there's no point in asking these two people to separately report the same number if you don't then go back and check that they report the same thing. Right, so there's huge returns for FBR to improve the capacity to do this cross-checking. However, there's an open question here, and it would be great to do some more work on this going forward, whether if you suddenly start telling people that you're going to be doing this cross-checking, this just leads to more collusion between the firms and the workers, and, and then they just jointly report the same but still under-reported amount, and what the tax authorities can do in response to that. Then at the beginning I mentioned that there are two separate tax schedules in Pakistan for the personal income depending on whether salary is more or less than half of your total taxable income. And so there's some considerations here as well. So the first one was that we showed that it's the firms that are setting the salaries rather than the workers picking their salaries. Now firms are much easier to monitor than workers are because first of all there's fewer of them, there's, there's, they're bigger, they're much more visible. So that argues for setting higher taxes on salary rather than lower taxes, because it's much easier to enforce this tax. I also showed you and tried to argue that non-salary income is extremely responsive. That argues that this, this E number in the first equation is very big, and so you should have lower taxes on non-salaried income. This is the exact reverse of the current system, which actually gives a massive tax break to salaried individuals. And so it's uh, something to consider in, uh, in designing the tax schedule going forward, whether you want to have this uh, two-tier system. That actually uh, concludes what I wanted to say. Thank you very much.